Good day to everybody everywhere. Thank you again for joining us for the Shangsheng School of Tibetan Medicine webinar series. Here on our ongoing webinar series, from our baseline of Tibetan medicine studies, we discuss topics of health and wellness. We explore tools from Eastern and Western medical traditions, from ancient spiritual philosophies uh, to healing sciences to modern research, and of course, current issues in global public health. How can we help and how can we contribute from our perspective of Tibetan medicine? What sort of tools and resources can we work with to help people in the modern life? And we'd love to have you subscribe and join our mailing list. And thank you for following us and thank you for tuning in today. On this week's webinar, our special guest uh, is the authorized instructor of the Santi Mahanga, Oliver Lake. We will discuss the well-known Buddhist icon of green Tara with Oliver uh, and, it's, and uh, her association with wisdom, empowerment, green Tara's association with good fortune, and of course, of uh, the boundless, infinite love of the divine femininity. So in these times of doubt and these severe challenges worldwide, meditation on this auspicious Buddha may help people overcome fear and obstacles, discovering their innate capacity for clarity and wisdom. So we think that this is a very appropriate topic for today, studying uh, the green Tara. And we're so happy to have Oliver with us today um, to uh, shed some insight onto that. So thank you all once again for joining us. This again is the Changsheng Institute School of Tibetan Medicine ongoing webinar series. And uh, with our school, let me tell you a little bit about uh, our school and our programs. We offer courses and programs on traditional Tibetan medicine all around the world and online, uh, ranging from short lectures to our uh, CEU continuing education units for healthcare providers, and then all the way up to our flagship program our four-year full-length training in uh, Tibetan medicine, traditional Tibetan medicine. So we have a few uh, exciting upcoming courses. And uh, the one that I want to tell you about most urgently is um, going to be a workshop with our um, Institute director, uh, Menpa Punsak Wangmo, coming up soon about how to make garlic ghee chudlen. Now chudlen is a well-known uh, medicinal practice used in traditional Tibetan medicine. It's known as taking the essences and the Chudlen formulas, there's a range of different types of formulas and they use all they use a deeply nourishing and restorative ingredients prepared in concentrated forms. And this particular formula, the medicinal garlic ghee Chudlen is one of the simplest and most potent and most broadly applicable Chudlen formulas described in the classical text of Tibetan medicine, the Gyuji. So this preparation soothes the overactive wind element uh, energies of our body and mind, this famous lung energy that we uh, always talk about in Tibetan medicine. We talk about the um, activity of the lung, the wind element uh, governing our neurological system, our mental emotional state, uh, our stress, our fatigue, our anxiety, our sleep issues, all of these kind of aspects are governed by the lung wind element energy. And so uh, this garlic ghee chudlen preparation is very good for balancing that lung. So it deeply nourishes our systems. It restores our vitality. It promotes good sleep, calm, clarity, as well as just the overall health uh, and the balance and longevity. So in these stressful times of anxiety and new challenges, uh, we are uh, very happy to present this simple and effective formula to benefit our lives. So in this upcoming live workshop, Menpa Punsak Wangmo will thoroughly present the theory and indications of medicinal garlic ghee chudlen. And she will teach us how to make the basic formula, the traditional ghee, and prepare the use of the uh, medicinal garlic ghee chudlen formula. And she will also discuss uh, modifications with various other herbs and ingredients to benefit individual conditions. So it's going to be a very broad and diverse uh, applicable range. So please join us to share in the knowledge of the ancient practice of medicinal garlic ghee chudlen. And this is going to take place live uh, on Sunday, October 18th. It's gonna be from 8 a.m. to 12.30. Um, 
Pacific Daylight Time or 11 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Uh, the Eastern Daylight Time. And for those of you who are tuning into the webinar, we have an exclusive discount promo code. So you can use the promo code WEBINAR10 uh, exclusively for our webinar attendees. Get 10% off of this upcoming course on October 18th. Uh, that's WEBINAR10, okay? And we'll probably link that in the show notes. Um, and then also the uh, recording will probably be available, but as Menpa Puntak Wangmo always reminds us, much uh, better, it's ideal to tune in live whenever possible to get that live connection and that live stream, similar to how we are enjoying with you right now today. So that's going to be how to make garlic ghee chudlen coming up uh, very soon in just a couple of weeks. Uh, and then also, as we always mention, we have our full length four-year program, our four-year training in traditional Tibetan medicine for those of you who are ready to very seriously study traditional Tibetan medicine. And that is going to be starting uh, in January, and we're still taking applications. So if you want more information about the Changsheng Institute School of Tibetan Medicine four-year program, uh, please contact us. And for more information to register about uh, for any of these programs, visit our website, uh, tibetanmedicineschool.org. Uh, or, or just uh, click on any of our links on Facebook or, or other, other social media. And of course, please, as we say, follow us, join our email list for other important updates and announcements and follow us on social media. And if you want to check out previous episodes of our webinar, you can go to our website, which again is uh, tibetanmedicineschool.org or also our YouTube uh, page uh, has our uh, archives as well. Finally, I'll mention the American Tibetan Medical Association, the Tibetan medicine professional organization uh, in the United States. And so if you want to get a little more actively involved in the Tibetan medicine community here in the United States, or if you want resources on learning about upcoming programs or finding a qualified practitioner in your local area, um, and if you just want to support, uh, we are accepting memberships. So you can uh, check out ATMA, the American Tibetan Medical Association, at American Tibetan Medical Association.org. All right, excellent. So we're moving on to our topic. So today our special guest is Oliver Lake, is an authorized instructor of the Santi Maha Sangha, which is the comprehensive Buddhist Dharma training program developed by our institute founder, Chogyal Namkai Norbu, uh, one of the world's uh, leading uh, Tibetan Dzogchen uh, masters and uh, Tibetologist Tibetan cultural scholars as well uh, for many decades before his recent passing. So Oliver has led more than 150 retreats and has given numerous talks on Tibetan culture uh, and spiritual practice in diverse venues worldwide. Oliver serves on the board of directors of the Ati Yoga Foundation, which is the spiritual and cultural organization founded by Chogyal Namkai Norbu, kind of the umbrella organization for uh, uh, Chogyal Namkai Norbu's many uh, institutes and uh, practices that he instituted throughout his life worldwide. <clears throat> That's the Ati Yoga Foundation. So Oliver has served as the director of the Shangsheng Institute for Tibetan Studies, uh, our school, the Shangsheng Institute, School of Tibetan Medicine is part of the worldwide Greater Shangsheng Institute, uh, which has uh, uh, numerous types of programs for Tibetan cultural studies, of which Tibetan medicine is just one. So uh, Oliver has served as the director of that greater organization for the last 20 years, actually. And recently, um, Oliver retired from his career as a school teacher in 2016 uh, and is living uh, very well with his family in Austria now. Oliver, thank you so much for joining us. How are you today? Thank you. Hello. Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. And so please let me also introduce our ongoing webinar host, Menpa Punsak Wangmo. Menpa Punsak Wangmo is a practitioner of traditional Tibetan medicine with over 30 years of experience in clinical practice as well as teaching. She received her advanced degree from the Lhasa University School of Traditional Medicine. Uh, Menpa Wangmo is the director of the Shangsheng Institute School of Tibetan Medicine. Uh, she has developed our programs and spearheaded and driven our, our school forward for many years now. Uh, she teaches Tibetan medicine all around the world, developing programs and teaching students in a broad community uh, in the United States, 
in Spain, Italy, Russia, and many places. Menpal Wangmo is also the co-founder of the American Tibetan Medical Association, ASMA, the uh, Tibetan Medicine Professional Organization in the United States here. Menpal Wangmo, wonderful to see you again. Thank you for joining us. And so I will be your moderator today. My name is Adam Okerblom. I'm a doctor of acupuncture and oriental medicine and practitioner of traditional Tibetan medicine and educator uh, here living and working in the uh, beautiful San Francisco Bay Area in California, where uh, thankfully the air is finally starting to clear up. I am an alumni. I'm an, uh, an alumnus of the Shangsheng Institute for your program, and I also currently serve on the board of directors. So I will be here uh, to help out today. And finally, we would like to offer a uh, special thanks to uh, Matthew Schmuckler for our tech support and helping us out online behind the scenes, and also for our team of translators who help us out sharing our webinar in various countries around the world. So let's begin. So Oliver, how are you today? And can you tell us where you are and um, how things are going just for introduction's sake? Yeah, hello everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation to be with you to, today. I am in Austria, that is in Europe, in the center of Europe. And uh, I am fine. Here we have quite an uh, increasing number of COVID cases. But uh, I am in the countryside and I'm fine. And I'm just happy to be with you right now. Wonderful, we're very happy too. So today we're going to discuss Green Tara, this iconic, uh, famous Buddha um, in the Buddhist tradition. Um, Green Tara is kind of ubiquitous worldwide in the world of Buddhism in many different countries. And in fact, as I understand, the um, iconography of uh, Green Tara extends uh, uh, very far back in history uh, and is something uh, that was already kind of a, an ancient and well-established tradition at the time of Buddha Shakyamuni millennia ago. So today we're gonna discuss how we, uh, some of the nature of Green Tara and how we can work with this practice in daily life for the many serious challenges that are affecting us. So as we launch into that, can you start by telling us a little bit about your personal history as a school teacher in Austria? How did you come to devote your life to studying and teaching, working with the uh, Tibetan Buddhist Dharma? Well, <clears throat> um, I finished my school and uh, before studying at the university, then uh, uh, my parents died. So my father died already in a car accident when I was five years old. And my mama died just uh, one year after my finishing my high school. So then I have still two sisters, but one sister has always lived in India and one already in, in, uh, in London. So I was more or less alone. Uh, and uh, I didn't know so much what to do with my life. And then for whatever reason, because of my, actually because of my sister living in, in India, uh, she was the, she studied uh, Tibetan, she's Tibetologist, and she was the translator for the six, uh, the Holy, His Holiness, the 16th Gyalva Karmaba, when Gyalva Karmaga went to America for his uh, famous tour to the States, and she was uh, one of her translators. So the aspect of Tibetan Buddhism was quite familiar to us in the, in the family already when I was 14, I heard something about it. I didn't understand the glue about it, nothing at all. And I also didn't believe it. Well, I mean, just because it is my sister, you know, <laughs> it was not really the main course. But uh, it was interesting because I could see that my sister is quite touched by it. And uh, she really uh, made me, uh, gave me an impression that it, it, there is something which I did not discover yet. And then I was very lucky. Uh, then I went to Denmark right after my, the death of my mama. I went to Denmark. And uh, there I met the Tibetan Lama, the first one. Actually, I didn't want to meet him. I was very shy. 
very afraid. <laughs> and then uh, I, after some stories, then uh, I had an interview with, the, with this master. I never met him afterwards again, but I just remember that his face was like a shining sunshine, completely fantastic, really. I have still that impression that actually there was not a per human person sitting, but the manifestation of the sun, golden shining and just brilliant smiling. And then I, he asked me about my life story. Then I told him that uh, my parents died. And then he told me, ah, you go back to Austria when you are finished here. And then you read some books. And then uh, for example, the one like the life story of Milarepa. And then you will see something will happen in your life. So then I went home to Austria after some months. And uh, really, first of all, His Holiness Gyalba Karmapa came to Austria. I took refuge. I didn't understand the word. <laughs> Nothing at all, really, but I was impressed. And because of my sister, because she was his interpreter and translator, I had many private talks with His Holiness Gyalba Karmapa. And uh, we became uh, somehow good friends, somehow, because I didn't understand any word what he said. Just more or less tried to be a good person and feel compassion, something like that. Then I started even to practice something, but I was a little, well, not so sure what I'm doing. Soon afterwards, uh, the fun, great, unique Tibetan yogi, uh, Kalu Rinpoche, the old one, not the new one. He came again to Vienna in Austria. And you know, I was educated in the school and I had many teachers in religion. And they did what they do well, in German, you call it, they were teach, uh, preaching wine, but drinking water. Uh, no, they were preaching water, but drinking wine. So they, their attitude was not according to that was they were teaching. But when I saw Kalu Rinpoche, I knew, even if I did not understand what he was teaching, I knew that this person is an, a manifestation of endless compassion, and he is just teaching that what he is manifesting right in that moment. Again, due to be based uh, due to my sister's help. I was the photographer of Kalu Rinpoche. I was always very near around him and I was so impressed. And I knew, well, now I discovered something. And then really a few weeks later, Jögenam Kanobuk came to Vienna. That was in 1977. And then, you know, I was really spoiled a little bit in school from the teachers in religion. They were beating me up because I was quite a naughty disciple. But they were the only teachers, they always were beating me in school were the, the religious teachers. Always, every day I was beaten. And so I didn't like this aspect of religion, really. And then I, when I met Jürgen Amke Nobu, I felt at home. I felt so, wow, for the first time there is somebody not saying to me, Oliver, you have to do first this, then this, then that, then that. He just told me, well, be as you are and try to understand what you do, be present. And then all the other teachings, what he gave, still I didn't understand a lot, but I immediately practiced. And the first practice what I did was Yantra Yoga. And I became a very, very dedicated practitioner and since 1977, so this is 43 years ago, I have been dedicating my entire life to practicing, to uh, trying to understand what the teachings, what is the meaning of the teachings. And so, yeah, now yeah, that is very, for me, it's a very, very special moment because in two days on uh, Sunday, the 27th of September, we will have the second anniversary of the Paranirvana Nirvana of our of Jogenam Kanobu, of our teacher. So I'm very, very dedicated to the, also to that moment and to, to do my practice and to unite somehow 
in, uh, with uh, that what I received from my teacher. That is a long introduction how I met the teachings and so on. Wow, thank you for sharing that. That's a really special story, your personal history. So you had all of that um, tragic loss early in your life. And then, uh, but, the, but through your whole life, through your sister and your family, you have connection to the Dharma on, in various levels. Um, I, I love how, how the Rinpoche told you, um, you know, oh, go read. He recognized that connection in you very clearly through this clarity that he had. And then he said, oh, go read some books and something will happen. I love yeah. that. That's indicative of the kind of clarity and wisdom that many uh, Tibetan masters, the Rinpoches, will, will express is this kind of innate clarity of being able to just look at you for a few moments and understand something about your capacity to discover the teachings. So. Yes. Wow. So you, uh, you met Chogyal Namkai Norbu, uh, who is, of course, the founder of our institute and, um, and our uh, spiritual teacher as well. And then you uh, spent quite a bit of time working with him. So can you tell us a little bit more about your times working with uh, Chogyal Namkai Norbu in the ensuing decades? And then specifically, how did you come to... Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Oops. Oops. Sorry. Yeah. So then specifically, how did you come to, uh, to teach the Santi Maha Sangha? And uh, can you remind us, what is the Santi Maha Sangha program? Okay, so, you know, um, I am not a very intellectual person. I'm more a practical person. I, I, did, I was not a good disciple in school. I never liked to study the intellect, intellect, intellectual studies. But I always was just jumping into it, whatever it was, sport, yoga, whatever it was, always I was jumping directly there. And so with Chögyanam Kanobu, I followed so many retreats and the Chögyanam Kanobu offered so many practices and I never asked why. I was young, you know, I met uh, Jagan Amkanova when I was 22 years old. So I didn't ask why, but I did one week retreat here, three weeks here, another three weeks here, oh, all different parts, different, different parts of, of uh, the, 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 the aspect of the, the, the real aspect of the teachings. I could not more or less connect them. It was more or less like a puzzle, you know, with thousand pieces and you try to make a picture out of that. And I just looked at each of this piece of the puzzle. I know it looked nice. Okay, I put it there. It could be there. <laughs> then uh, then uh, there was uh, one moment I was in, in Italy, the place where Jürgen Amkanobu was teaching in that era. That was in the late 80s, beginning of the 90s. I was around there and suddenly it was after the teachings of Rinpoche. And then uh, we were just having fun a little bit. And then Jürgen Amkanobu told me, Oliver, come here. And then I went to him and then he said, Oliver, do you want to get the real essence of all teachings. I said, yeah, of course, please, master, give it to me. And then he said, okay, how much do you want to pay? I looked at him very strange. And then I said, well, you know, I'm a student. Uh, I haven't, well, I just had a, work, a job, yes, but a very low income. And then I said, but just, just wait. Just wait, I go to my friends and ask how much we can collect. <laughs> so I went to around and asking because I knew some of uh, our people had some money and then we collected, I, I, I mentally we collected. And then I said, well, if you can borrow me, I will pay back when 
<laughs> more money and so on. Then after maybe 20 minutes, I went to Jürgen Amkanovo and said, well, you know, I, you could see me, I tried my best. It's not the big amount of money, but we could offer you something. And the Jürgen Amkanovo was just breaking out laughing and ha ha ha, really endless laughing. I thought, wow, what did I do wrong? And then he said, do you really think that you can get the teachings by paying for them? Are you completely mad? Didn't you understand anything what I said up to now? Then I said, well, I don't know, you asked me. <laughs> he said, no, the teachings are beyond money, much far. So, but I will give you. And then one, uh, and, uh, soon afterwards, it was in the beginning of 90s. Soon afterwards, Jirganam Kanobu gave the first teachings, what is called Santi Mahasanga. And when I heard these first teachings, I knew that is that what Rinpoche asked me. Do you want to get the essence of everything? That is what Rinpoche was offering. Of course, without money, that is not the, has, that has nothing to do with money. So what is Santi Mahasanga? Uh, Sangha is a, a Sanskrit word uh, and it means uh, community. Uh, and uh, Santi Maha, that means doctrine. So Maha means great. And Santi is something like, uh, uh, what is it? It's also, uh, well, uh, it, it's called, the, like Dzogchen is called the, the path of self-liberation. Um, the, the teachings of Santi Mahasanga is the understanding of all Buddhist philosophies, starting to get an inside understanding of the teachings orally taught by, by Buddha, that uh, then afterwards were written down and they are called the sutra teachings that are the oral teachings of Buddha. Then there were the teachings of transformation. They were transmitted not anymore by Buddha in his physical form, but uh, through the Mahasiddhas and special beings. And then uh, there is also these teachings of, of uh, self-liberation um, uh, where it is explained uh, who you are, what you are, why you are, <laughs> all these aspects. And that is in order to understand the Dzogchen, that is what Rinpoche always was teaching. That is, uh, you should or you have to understand all the other paths to liberation, the path, paths towards liberation, the Sutric path, the Vajrayana path, and so on. So there, and this part, and there with the Santimaha Sangha training, you really, you get an, uh, you have to study, of course, but not only intellectually, you have to practice that because only if you practice it, you get an experience of that, what it is communicated. You get an experience of what are the Sutric teachings. You, you should practice them and then you get experience. And the same for the Vajrayana teachings where you need a a teacher to give you a transmission and so on. But uh, without that, it's really difficult to have a real understanding of this famous teachings of Dzogchen, what Rinpoche was teaching. So I studied Santi Mahasanga since uh, 1992 until now. And uh, I became authorized teacher for Santi Mahasanga, the base level which is actually including everything. It, is, it includes more or less the point of view of all the different paths towards liberation, but also some practices and also um, how to, the attitude, how should be the attitude of a practitioner or, of a, or someone who follows these teachings. And then uh, there are several levels and uh, but in order to teach that, that is something else you can, you do not need to teach Santima Sangha uh, in a, if you want to study that, that is something else. 
So I followed all levels that Rinpoche has offered in his life. I studied all the way, it came to the level four. That is why I went for me, this, uh, the practice of Santima Sangha, and especially also the teaching of it, that has become uh, really one of my, the main part of my life because it covers everything. And especially, and that is the important thing, that what do you learn from all these teachings? You do not learn how to do rituals. No, that is of course, it's, if you want to learn, you can learn. But the main thing is you learn how to do an ordinary life, how to live in society as an ordinary person. You do not have to become a monk or a nun. You don't need to change anything. You are just that what you are with your job, with your family, in your environment. You do not change anything. You're just very normal, ordinary person. And that is, uh, that, that, that is the main practice. And all that, what, uh, what is explained in Santima Sangha is more or less explaining how is your everyday life? How is your 24 hours of your day? And then you can look at it. Where do you have problems? Where it's difficult for you? Where do you have fears? Where do you have problems? Where are your emotions coming? And why and how, the, how is it not possible for you to stay in a relaxed state? All that is Santima Sangha. Wonderful, wow. Okay, so Oliver, can you please tell us, let's have you tell us a little bit about Green Tara, this famous Buddha in uh, Tibetan Buddhism. Give us uh, just kind of a introduction for those of us who are not familiar, would you please? <clears throat> well, if you look uh, in the history of human mankind, there has always been some kind of female manifestation which is represented uh, as a manifestation of wisdom. For example, when I was in Hawaii, here you have the goddess Pele, the, the, uh, the goddess of Hawaii. When you go or when you read the ancient uh, Greek philosophies, then you have Sophia, that is the wisdom. So then when you go in Italy, for example, may, or when you're a follower of Christianity, you have uh, Mary, the mama of uh, Jesus Christ. And in, in Italy, it's called Madonna. So in all cultures where you find there's always a kind of female form that where people are praying to, and uh, when you uh, have a when you pray with dedication and devotion, it has always uh, brought some special benefit to those who were showing this devotion and dedication. <coughs> and Tara is one of them. <coughs> Tara is more or less the manifestation in in Asia. There is an interesting story about Tara. It's especially for in, in our life now is interesting. I, there are so many stories how Tara manifested, how she was born and so on. That is really so many, I don't tell so many, but there, uh, the, main, uh, the main aspect is that uh, the, according to the, to the texts that I was studying and I studied now the texts on green Tara uh, we, whatever I could find, there were something like 15 books for the last uh, one and a half years. I studied them precisely. And so in uh, one of the stories, and that is also explained in nearly all books, that there was this manifestation called Avalokiteshvara. That is the, a deity, a manifestation of compassion, a Buddha of, uh, let's say a Buddha of compassion. And this Buddha of compassion uh, let's say it in very simple words, that was uh, trying to understand the real nature of life. And uh, like the story of, of uh, Buddha himself sitting under the tree and then uh, 
he got the, he was he got the kind of state of awakening and he understood well the nature of life is suffering and so there this uh this manifestation of compassion he uh, or th that is actually beyond sex but this this manifestation got the answer got the answer to the real question why do we have all this suffering in life and how can we overcome that? And then when he opened the eyes, he could see that although he was uh, getting, uh, having that awakening state, looking around, he could see the people around him still not having that state of awakening, still being totally fixed and imprisoned by their their suffering and by their different kinds of understanding of the world. And so he started to cry, to cry out of compassion. And what, one of his tears was running down from his face. And according to the story, uh, this, the, 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 the tear, the one of the, the tear coming from the eye of this manifestation of compassion manifested as green Tara. And then she was manifesting and she told to this uh, Avalokiteshvara, to this uh, manifestation of compassion, she said to him, oh, please, Avalokiteshvara, don't worry. I will help you to liberate all beings from suffering. And I give you a promise. I will always come back to this uh, dimension. This is our human dimension in a female form and I will come back as long as until the last human sentient beings is liberated from the suffering. You know, that is for us sounds maybe quite nice, interesting and so on, but you have to think about when that happened. And that was, uh, that was many thousand years ago. Buddha was born 2,500 years ago already before Jesus Christ. In that period, ladies were not much respected. Actually, in some teachings it is written, in order to understand the real meaning of life, it is not good if you have a female body. It is said like that. Some texts say it is even impossible to reach the famous enlightenment when you're a female. So therefore then the, the studied people went to Tara and said, oh, please Tara, uh, uh, we understand you're very nice and very good and everything, but uh, please consider that it's you, when you say you want to be, to be, to help always in a female form, you will never manage it because female is not really something good. But she said, oh, who cares? <laughs> really, who cares? I, I made this promise and I come back as a female form. So she, you see, she is, from my aspect, already the first manifestation of feminism. <laughs> not being under the, always the pressure of the man saying, oh, we are number one and so on. It's not at all. She was the first one saying, oh, female forms is something very special. And then why is it special and how? And that is again, in all the cultures of human mankind, it is female forms is connected to wisdom. And uh, like Sophia in Greek, Sophia is actually called the Greek form that is called wisdom. So for example, in, in the, in the teachings, the teachings of what is called the teachings of transformation or Vajrayana teachings, there are two principles. The one is tap and the other one is sherab. Tap means method and uh, sherab means wisdom. So for example, today, even uh, the, thanks to the uh, great spirits also coming from California, a day we are managing to go to the moon, to the Mars, with the rocket we can fly in the, in the orbit and the rocket even comes back and can be used a couple of times. 
That is fantastic. It wouldn't have been possible some years ago. This is really great. But what is it? That is a method, a method to do something. And uh, we, we, we need a method to do something, but this method should lead to a wisdom. Method alone is not helping at all. For example, you know, in the period of the second, between the first and second world war, uh, there was a, there were very famous scientists and they discovered the power of nuclear, nuclear forces. Their intention was that could, that could this discovery could be helpful for human mankind. That was a method. This is the aspect of tap. But then you, you know what happened? Then they developed the atom bomb and that destroyed so many thousands and thousands of people. So that is a manif uh, 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 um, uh, proof that there might be fantastic methods, but uh, the wisdom is missing. And so Tara is really this uh, manifestation of wisdom. And then I quote some, some texts here saying, the basis for realizing enlightenment is a human body. It doesn't say female body. It, it, it continues, male or female, there is no difference. But if she develops the, ma the mind bent to enlightenment, the woman's body is better. These are the words of Guru Padmasambhava. He brought the Tibetan Buddhism in India, in, in Tibet in the eighth century. So he says, I repeat, male or female, there is no great difference. But if she develops the mind bent to enlightenment, a, woman, uh, a woman's body is better. So you see, it's a completely contradiction to that what was the point of view uh, some centuries ago. So the, the aspect of wisdom that is Tara, and I will come on, what is the use of this wisdom? What, how can we enter into that wisdom? That is just a brief or quite long introduction to what Tara is and uh, how difficult it was for her in these times as a lady. Thank you. That's an excellent introduction, Oliver. So the union of method and wisdom, and we can have all the fancy um, developed methods we want, but if we don't have the wisdom that is rooted in the feminine aspect, then what are we going to do? So I believe a moment ago, did you suggest that um, Elon Musk and the SpaceX could benefit from uh, the wisdom of Green Tara? I hope so. I mean, I don't know if Elon Musk knows about it, but I mean, he is an excellent mind, according to my understanding, and uh, has a good idea of what to do. And uh, if he is, uh, that is important to say, the practice of uh, Tara is only beneficial if you have no self-interest. That is important. So if you only do try to gain something for yourself, that practice or all that, what you do never works, not at all. So either Elon Musk has, has in his eye, in his mind only money, I don't know if then it will work, but if he has in mind this altruistic mind that I, all that what he discovers and so on will benefit the human mankind, then uh, I wish him all the best and uh, I hope that the wisdom will manifest, yeah. Absolutely. Yes, I hope so too. So I think what you're talking about is something we can see very pervasively in a modern society, very pertinent for what's happening right now. We have all of this amazing technology, all of these incredible methods, uh, kind of, uh, and, but then uh, it really does seem very clear that we are often lacking that wisdom component. So we have these fantastic methods for internet, social media platforms, um, space technology, um, but uh, resource extraction technology, but where is the wisdom to guide us for an altruistic future? So wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing that with us now. 
Uh, so let's give you a, a break and let's go to uh, Menpa Punta Guangmo, our school um, director and practitioner of Tibetan medicine. Menpa Wangmo, uh, thank you for hosting our webinar today as always. Thank you. <laughs> so can you please tell us, I know that, uh, can you please tell us a little bit about uh, Green Tara in your own, in your life experience and then the greater perspective of Green Tara in traditional Tibetan culture. Can you start to tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> okay. So, as Oliver said before, it's such sort a of nice to hear his talk. It's a great, really, be here with him. Uh, so, the Tibetan culture is a green tara. It's a sort of like a very diffused and a common and very important a sort of like a figures in our life. So in Tibetan, we believe the green Tara is one sort of like when we are lifetime, when we have any obstacles, the green, we can pray to the green Tara and then she can manage to help us to resolve from that issue. And also meantime, also we can sort of like a practice on her and then to liberate in this life to get sort of like ultimate. So simply I would say is like the Tibetans, we, one, we pray in this life some when we have problems because she is omniscient and then she is sort of like promised as Oliver said, is front of the Awadok Tushwara. She said, whoever has the problem, whoever needs it, I will be there and I will help. So for this reason, sort of like the, whenever we have problems, we pray, but does not mean as we pray, then we resolve everything clean, no, because it's the karma is always involved, you know? But still we pray sincerely, and then the meantime, also we do in practice on, on her and then to sort of like it to ultimate sort of like that we practice the green tara is like the temporary issues and the permanent issues, both way we practice on green tara. So that is sort of like the one in the Tibetan culture parts. So, Almost every Tibetan, they know all those like 21 Taras, they dedicate practice, homage, so all those kind of things we know. When I was uh, young, when I grown up time, every evening after dinner, and then the whole family need to sort of like sit as like a circle near the fire stove. And then one of the family member lead the practice and then we need to chanting and we need to do the practice. Every day we need to chanting like three times all this trying to want that practice. So even many of people is illiterate, but they know all those prayers through their mind memorized. So because we practice very small, so this is sort of like how we involved in our life. And then my own experience or own practice, these kind of things, what I use is, um, I use sort of like a many times when I became sort of like, a, um, maybe I would say like hopeless because I did not know what will happen. Oh, sometimes my friends, they tell me something is not going well for them. <clears throat> and then often I say to them, okay, don't worry, come and sit with me and we will do a practice of the data together. So some, the many times I'm as a Tibetan medicine practitioner and the many times the ladies or gentlemen comes, they say, we married, I really like to have a children, but somehow I'm not managed to succeed that issue. So then I say, okay, you do all the health checks, 
make sure physically everything's okay. Meantime, we do the green data practice and then you will see, we will see. So it's uh, doing this many uh, people also succeed and to receive whatever the goal is, wish is. And then many also my friend, they're losing jobs, you know. So when they're losing job is, uh, with a job is not so easy to keep life. So without a job and then it's more worse, you know. So for this kind of issue, again, there comes to me say, what can I do? I lost my job, you know. If they lost job, they could not sleep. Could not sleep, then it became more worse. So then again, I tell them, is it okay, don't worry. We sit together, we do practice of data and we will see what happens. Also many people after practice is they got job. They say, oh, I got job, now it's okay, but I still keep my practice because I need to keep the job. So this is not only to find a job or to find a something like a, whatever the temporary wishes, but if we really dedicate, if we really know essence of the green data practice or the data practice, also is really changing your natures, changing your characters, and really sort of like it develops your own personal tolerance with any circumstances. So this also really, I liked, because this, the practice of the green data, to head a children. So we have many stories. An example, like a, our teacher, Namgano Borembochi, and his family also, he, the family had several sisters before having a son. And then the, the both parents, especially the father, a little bit sort of like a desperate, you know. That does not mean the Tibetan don't like the, the daughters. No, we don't have this kind of such a highly sort of like di divided, but it's to do the, the heavy job need a son because it's not like today, everything can be done by pushing one bottom and they do everything, you know, like electric. So everything need to have sort of like physical. So then they invited uh, um, a Lama. The Lama wasn't a such a highly educated, but is a Lama know how to do very well the Tara practice. So then this Lama's name also nickname sort of like we call the Dhamma Lama. So then the, the, the Dhamma Lama, why is a Dhamma Lama? Because he do just practice of the Dhamma. So that way he got also the, the name, the family just called that way. And then he practice is a succeed to head the, the Rinpoche and then also another two, like another one son. So this kind of that the practice of the Tara, it works. It's a, not something like a fig, you know, like a fantasy sort of like a history, really somehow somewhere helped. No, is it like a physically, logically, is a sort of like it works. So that way also I use the green Tara practice into my healthcare when I sort of like some people works with herbs, some people works with a diet, some people works with the breathing, some people works with the sort of like the certain movement, but some people doesn't work all of them. So yoga cannot do because of the, the, the joint, okay. Medicine cannot take it because of allergy, okay. So cannot move this way, that way. So then this kind of time, what I do is to using this kind of like a practice, say simply, it's just pray sincerely. So when you ask to someone something, how you get the answer, reply, succeed, also how sincerely you're doing, you know, you are honest, they will be honest. Also, the, when I was with the Rinpoche, many people asking how long sh I should do the green data practice or green or white or whatever that data practice to get a sort of like a, a, so, to get a sort of like a science. And then the Rinpoche said to me, he answered how you do. If you do sincerely, 
and then you will get quicker answers, signs. Because is also when we do the practice, so with asking sort of like chanting the mantras of the Tara, but the quantities of that mantra, it is important, but the main important is the qualities. So for this kind of reason, if you do really is well quality and with you sincerely, then also you get better, quicker answers or I mean the, the signs or the, the, the result. So this is what I do in daily life. So that is the, what I'm answering based on your question or I'm doing something <laughs> out of my mind. <laughs> 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 so that's that's really great. Thank you. Thank you so much. So you started going directly into uh, my next question. I was going to ask you um, about using green Tara in the context of Tibetan medicine and the medical practice. So you already described uh, something about that very profoundly. Uh, is there anything else that you thought would be important to share about green Tara with Tibetan medicine uh, in any way? Yeah, um, the Tara we call is a Dolma. Dol means is free. Dol is if you have something suffering and there's someone take you from that suffering, put it into a place where is the not suffering. So that is sort of like Dol. Dol means is free. Ma is like a mother. So mother is sort of like base of the compassion. Also, his holiness, many times he said, is like his compassion. First, his teacher was his mother. His mother is very kind, a compassionate person. So he said his first compassion learned from her. So the mother is sort of like a universal. Mother means is like a ground, like earth. And the mother is sort of like attaching to whole sentient beings. Whole sentient being we living with the mothers. Without a mother, cannot survive anything. Even though there's a chicken egg, without a mother, they cannot produce the chicken. Any insect, included plants, everything we grow, we live, we get the, the life, we live with a mother. Not only we get the life, we live but we learn the sense of the, the, the life. Because is it, we all sort of like, uh, like to have a peaceful, kind, a life, peaceful, a life. And then the mother has this kind of sense, you know. So the, the different mother has a different quality, but it comes to the children and then your mother is the best mother. So either mother is wealthy or either mother is literated or mother is like a knowledgeable or not knowledgeable. So the Tara is like the, the mother of the whole universal. So that we call is a drama. So the burn tradition, they call the Chama. Cham is also like a kind, you know, Cham means is loving, kind. Chama, drama is sort of like very synonyms. So this is sort of like the, the Dolma. And also when we say sort of like the Dolma, as the Oliver said, is a Dolma stories of the Dolma is a lot of there's like, a, we could do sort of like a one year program to talk about the Dolma. But it's simply, she sort of like the, the seating on this, the lotus flowers, like the cushions, on top of that, there is like a moon disc. What the lotus flower presents, the lotus flower present is like the, the lotus flower is grows in the muddy place. Where the lotus flower grow is not the, the land or the water is not clean. They do not need clean, very high fancy quality water. They do not need. The lotus grows in the muddy place. But the, the way of the grow is without any dirt is very clean, lovely, beautiful. Even she's living into this, the human samsara when her time, like us, I guess, maybe doesn't have the cell phone, but it is still. 
you know, living as like human dimensions, but is grown up as fully clean a person. So she was very dedicated to the practice. She was very kind. She was very dedicated to the essential being's life. Even she was like a princess, but she's attitude is not like elegant, arrogant, like a princess, you know, Prin princess, yeah. And then even they said, okay, if you wanted, you can be as like the man's like body. She said, no, I prefer to stay as the, the female body and it dedicate to the females and then the rest of the world. I'm as a Tibetan medicine practitioners and then now like a long time. Before I came to in to the, the West country, I was one of the doctors who worked in the remote area. This is also the Rinpoche's advice and my own choose. I'm working as in a remote area as a, the doctor. And then really the females, they sometimes they doesn't want to share their feelings. Sometimes they're not easy to travel. Sometimes they doesn't know how to express their own feelings. Really a human, I mean the female body to have a female doctor is very convenient for them because we are same body, because we are same problems, because we are same sort of like a mental aspect. It's much easier to share in female's problem to a female than a man, and especially if you are monk, then it's more difficult to share in a daily life female's health problems to a man or to a monk, you know. So really, I wanted to be in the remote area, being their doctor, because as I see how I can benefit those females and then children. And the female's health is one of the very important, I mean, men's health is important, but the female health is like a whole family's health, you know? So this kind of like the, the Tara, what I'm going to say is like her attitude is very pure, transparent. Because as if you have pure, transparent, as his colony said, is then you don't have nothing to hiding, then you don't have to worry nothing. Because a lot of our fears, tensions brings with a our mind is not so transparent, not so clean, not so pure. Because we have jealous, because we have sort of like a anger, because we have something like a and truth, I say something to someone, maybe it's not really the truth. Then I'm worried this, that what I tell the untruth may discover, then I feel bad. So we have full like unnecessary hiding things which we do not need it. But the Tara, so those kind of like even grow in the muddy place, but it clean as like a lotus flower. So these kind of things. And then she's sitting sort of like in the discus of the moon. Moon has a many qualities. Moon can be sort of like the wisdom, symbolic of the wisdom. Moon could be also like a symbolic of the peace. Moon could be symbolic of the compassion. Moon could be peace, like a symbolic of the loving kind. In the Tibetan medicine that our Buddha medicine is a lapis lazula. Why is a lapis lazula not the diamond color? You know, like it looks like a diamond is more uh, uh, valued. Lapis lazula because it is like it, that the blue color, blue means is like sky. Blue does not have any sort of like favor this or that. So the blue has sort of like infinitive, like the humble, peace, harmonize. So this kind of reason also that the, that the green data, I mean, not only in green data, but also the data sitting on this, the discus of the moon, because it's like, a, say, I'm ready to harmonize to all sentient beings, their problems, 
So this kind of also really is uh, like uh, the highly sort of like uh, connect to the medicines. But generally, when we look in what is the medicines? Medicine means is a benefit. Your physical benefit or the mental benefit, that is a medicine. In the Tibetan, we call it as a man. So when we're looking like a Tibetan medicine, when we say men is and does not mean is all in the herbs, not all, does not mean is all in what we do like a kunya massage therapy. Also does not mean is all in we check a pulse. This is not the definitions of the Tibetan medicine. Tibetan medicine, the men means is the benefit to the sentient being. Whatever we can benefit them, this is a medicine. Is medicine is the man is not A or B or C. So as Rinpoche always said, it like work with the circumstance. Based on the circumstance by circumstance, then sort of like the, some people need more practice, some need breathing, some need herbs, some need diet. So work with the circumstance other than everything is into medicine. So like, it, like the Tara, the drama is, a sort of like a one of the physical relief deities and the mental relief deities. And also not only the, the temporary relief, the problems, but also if we do practice well, sincerely, also we could have relieved the ultimate problem. So that's sort of like the, what I, um, <laughs> what I see sort of like, or what I, at least what I do, I mean, the, I'm talking is it through my experience, you know, this is sort of like what I daily life do, so. <laughs> wow, thank you. Thank you so much, Menpo Wangmola. I, uh, I truly do appreciate our time on this webinar with you sharing these wonderful things with us. <laughs> really great. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Let's give you a break and let's go back to our special guest, uh, Oliver mm -hmm. Lake. Oliver, if you are still with us. Um, so you were telling me earlier that uh, you have some kind of tools or some insight on how we can uh, work with Green Tara to benefit daily life in the modern context. So if you have something to share with us about uh, uh, working with Green Tara uh, in daily life, can you please tell us about that? Yeah, I'm very happy about the words of uh, Dr. Punzogwamo because she already mentioned the aspect of mama or mother. <laughs> and that is uh, in many, many texts, Tara is called uh, great mother, for example. That is another name of her. Uh, but uh, in one text, it is said, that does not mean she, she's also called the mother of all Buddhas. But that in one text it is explained, that doesn't mean that she gave actually birth <laughs> to all the Buddhas. That is not the aspect. But it, uh, that would be the ordinary way of speaking. But it is more or less, the, she is the source of the enlightenment that is present in all of us. That is the meaning uh, of, of the Great Mother. And then, uh, uh, for example, uh, Tulku Urgen, he says, what is the benefit of Tara practice? He says, Tara practice and or in general deity practice is like receiving a light in a dark passage to guide us. So it brings us light in a, in a, in a dark passage. I want to focus on that sentence. Let's see our situation right now, worldwide. So worldwide, the whole world is now touched or uh, be in danger of the famous COVID-19 or coronavirus. The result of that is that many people are very much afraid of that. They have fears of that. In all the televisions worldwide, many experts are saying, 
this and that, all the different point of views. Some people say it's not true at all. It's all nonsense. That is only political aspect. Some people say, no, 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 no. It's really dangerous. We must be careful and so on. There are many demonstrations, for example, also everywhere in the world, like people say they want their freedom, take away our masks we have to, uh, we have to use when we go out. We want our freedom, we want to have our parties, we don't care about it. Yeah, that is already explained, all that is explained in Santima Sangha, for example. That uh, people are, there are many different kinds of people. One, one kind of people is they're just interested in having a good, happy life for themselves. They don't care for anything else. They have the idea there is nothing when we die. We are just come based on our idea of having fun this in this moment. Uh, okay. But then uh, when uh, Buddha started to teach and even before there was already the understanding, well, for example, how the story, how Buddha got enlightenment. He looked out over the, uh, uh, over the walls of his palace and he could see an old person. So he didn't know what means old. He saw a sick person. He didn't know what is sickness and he didn't, then he saw somebody carrying a corpse and bringing them to the courtyard. And he didn't know what it is. So that is, he understood that if you are a, a, a human being, but also sentient beings, then you are born, you are growing up. That means you get older. While getting older, you get sick. And then in the end you die. So that is somehow the rule, the universal rule of being here in this dimension of humans. And then some people, they say, oh, I don't mind because uh, especially when you're young, you say, no, I, am, I remember when I was young. No, I, the old people die, but I do not die. But you know, my father was 44 when he died in a car accident. He didn't want to die in that moment. It was quite early. I was five years old. So that means that to also people die when they are very young. So then there are people say, oh, I don't get ill. And if I get ill, then I go to the doctor and they cure me. Yes, that's true. They are, we are happy to have doctors. But then the doctors give you medicines. And if you say, oh, the doctor said I should take this medicine, but I don't care, I don't take it, then it's uh, useless. So then we have also people taking care of our mental health, not only of our body health, like then we go to the doctor or our, of our energetic health, that uh, we do some yoga exercise or some breathing exercise, but of our mental health. And then uh, this is like being a doctor. And then the, the, these uh, special people, the, these are called uh, teachers, they tell you what you could do. But if you do not take care of that, if you say, oh, all nonsense, then it is like the same, like going to the doctor, not using the medicine. And the result is that you get more ill and uh, you will probably die sooner. So Tara, this way we are talking here, especially about green Tara. Tara is very, very famous and has been famous in all the century that she is helping all sentient beings in a very, very quick way. So it is not like that, that you do some prayings, let's say, and that you have, then you have to wait 10 years <laughs> or one year or whatever, and then you will get the result. Tara is famous that she helps very quickly. That is also part of her name that is uh, uh, in, in, in her mantra, for example, that is already saying swift 
and heroic helping. That is her, uh, her action. So uh, how could you do in everyday life? <clears throat> For example, when you have a spiritual teacher and you have already some uh, what, uh, like a Tibetan teacher, well, what is called Rinpoche or Lama, that is very fine. Then you already have some instructions. But maybe you never have had any possibilities to meet one of these teachers or one of these people. But then is still, you are a human being and you are the same, you have the same value and you should be respected like everybody else. And you could do something in your everyday life. The first thing, what you need to do is you need to observe yourself. That is also the first teaching I received from my teacher, Jogenam Kanovo in 77. Observe yourself. Okay, I have a body. That body when I met my, ma, my teacher that was very young. And then uh, in this body you can move, you can walk, you can sit, you can eat, you can sleep, you can run, all these different things. Uh, be aware that this body will get older and so well, definitely you will get sick and there it's quite sure you will get, you will die. So that is number one. Then uh, observe yourself. How do you feel right in the moment? That is we can do right together, everybody of us. How do you feel right in the moment? Where do you sit, for example? Do you sit on a chair? Do you sit on a on the, uh, on, on, on the floor, do you sit in the, on the, in the car, listening uh, to the, uh, while driving the, to this uh, webinar? Wherever you sit, you are aware of your sitting now. And then uh, you're inhaling and exhaling in this body continuously. You know, you inhale and you exhale. It's very simple, isn't it? It's not very difficult. I give you another advice of my teacher Sergei, that he gave me in 77. He told me, Oliver, try to remember that you're inhaling and exhaling five times a day. That was his advice. I thought, oh, mamma mia, this uh, teacher is giving a very, very simple task to me. I do. <laughs> Okay, I inhale and exhale now five times. Then I, but then my teacher told me, no, 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 in five different moments. And then I said, okay, I will do. But it's too simple. I want something more difficult. <laughs> but you know what happened? Five days later, I remembered. Oh yes, my teacher told me something. <laughs> Be aware of your breathing every five times a day. And I am still doing that and applying that practice since 43 years. And now I, after all these years, I manage now in five, at least five different moments, maybe some more to be aware of my, of my, of my breathing. But then that is related to your breathing. Everybody, you can do that. You can apply that. That is no secret. Just be aware of your breathing. You don't do any visualization, nothing. Just inhale, exhale while you're driving. When it is Sunday morning, there is no job. You're relaxing in bed. Observe your breathing. It's maybe very long, relaxed. And you do, you know, that's exhalation. Then you go to breakfast. Mm, such a good breakfast. Your breathing is very relaxed. And then you observe your breathing while you are checking or looking for a parking space in the middle of a traffic jam in, the, in your town. Observe your breathing. Where is the parking place? I need, I have a, a meeting soon. I have to find something. Observe, you, you see that your breathing is very, very quick and very short, not like that one at the Sunday morning. And so you can observe it in different moments. That's a practice everybody can do. And then uh, the other aspect is your mind. And that is, how do you feel? And the answers could be, 
I feel well, I don't feel well, or I feel so-so, normal, people say normal. This means neutral, not good, not bad. Okay, then if, uh, if there is a, if the, I give you a story. <laughs> Another advice for everybody. That was a book I read in, this is from Akong Rinpoche. Uh, I read it in 76. And there was the story of, uh, the story goes, there was one prince in India many, many, many years ago. And uh, sometimes he was very happy and sometimes he was not very happy. And when he was happy, he was just enjoying these moments of happiness. And when he was sad and unhappy, really he was very unhappy. And he was, oh, what is happening? I don't know, I want to change. I want to be happy again. So then he went to one of these wise men, wise people they were in India. And they, he was telling the story. Well, sometimes I feel happy and sometimes I don't feel happy at all. How can I be always happy? And then the, this wise person told to, to this prince and said, wear a ring, wear one uh, like a ring, like that one. And then he said, well, that should help, just wearing a ring. <laughs> and then he said, yeah, but uh, on that ring, there is written something. I don't tell you what, but he gave him the ring and they put it on, the, on his hand. And the wise man said, when you are, uh, very unhappy, you look at the ring and read it. And when you're very happy, you do the same. So then uh, he was very happy afterwards. And for a long time, he was very happy and for, he forgot totally, like I forgot to breathe five times a day, but <laughs> my teacher told me. So he forgot about the ring. And then there came the moment where he was uh, very unhappy. And then he remembered, ah, yes, this person told me I should look at my ring. And so he looked at the ring and then he read it for the first time. And then uh, he found, he discovered what was written there. And, they say, and it was saying, also this is passing by. This is changing. And in that moment when he was unhappy and he could read that this will pass by, he was very happy, he was relaxed. Now I'm a little unhappy, but I'm sure it will pass by, it will go by, it will change because everything is impermanent. So then he was happy. And then when he was happy again, he also remembered to look at the ring. He looked at the ring, there also that will pass by. He became unhappy a little bit because he wanted to continue in his state of being happy and enjoyable. But finally, he discovered the nature of impermanence and he became very relaxed in his life. <clears throat> so that is a good story we could uh, do in our everyday life. And then coming back to Tara. <laughs> when you are in a moment when you are not happy, when you are sick, when you are being in hospital, when you have mental problems, whatever. Observe it. They are not fantasy, they are true. When you're sick, you're sick. But when you're there, I, I, uh, when you're there in hospital, I have been in hospital many times in the last year. And one of my colleagues next to me, he also told me the same. I asked him, how do you do out just after the operation? How do you feel? And he said, well, painful, everything is painful. But you know, this pain is not really heavy because I just think about the people who really have much more pain. And just by thinking of the suffering of others, my little pain diminishes and already helps me to overcome it. But of course the pain doesn't go away, but it is not anymore so, so heavy. So that is this aspect. Think about the suffering of others. Think about your suffering, think about the other suffering, and still your suffering is not going away. 
but you're more relaxed in it. You are taking it on. You have still fear and problems, but they are not ruling you anymore. Because like, uh, like somebody sharing, sharing uh, the, the wish that everybody should be happy and healthy, that uh, overcomes or over, overrules your egoistic aspect of, I have pain, I am the only one in the world who is really poor and only I'm the only one suffering. If you really observe yourself well, that is a very egoistic aspect because everybody is suffering. So even if I did not mention now the aspect of green Tara, that what I just explained of observing yourself and trying to do something for the benefit of others, that is a part of the practice of Tara. I will speak a little bit more later on, but that is the main aspect that you remember that was the first instruction or recommendation I received from my teacher when I was 22 years old. Observe yourself. Excellent. Thank you very much, Oliver. So from there, that kind of baseline of presence and observation, then uh, what would you like to tell us more about uh, how we can work with the green Tara in the daily life? Okay, we need to go a little bit deeper. After we have observed ourselves, we can understand what is actually everything outside of ourself, like a beautiful car, like a rocket going to the Mars, like the newest Tesla car, like the newest Apple uh, iPhone or whatever. What is it? And the answer is very simple. Also our Western scientists have already discovered it, that everything what is there outside is not really that what our mind tells us, but it is just an accumulation of atoms. The atoms can be, again, they have an atom, uh, what did it, the, the, the center of the atom, I don't know in English, uh, you know that, and that you can split again and split again and split again. So the Western scientists have already proved that that what we see outside like wardrobe, walls, trees, actually is nothing else than an accumulation of uh, certain the chemical uh, processes and they manifest as a tree or as a statute or as a table, whatever. So that was our, this wisdom already was known many thousand years ago in India. And that is this famous, what it is called, that everything actually is emptiness, but not emptiness of really empty and there is nothing else, that would be a very sad point of view. But I mean, when we open our eyes and we understand that that what we see is more or less like a dream, it, or it doesn't exist, it is just emptiness is another word, but still we see that uh, so many people are suffering. So this emptiness is floated with endless compassion. There is a compassion and empty, this aspect of emptiness, they're inseparable. And so this is the base for the practice of Tara. For example, another name for Tara is called, she is Prajnaparamita. Maybe you do not know that name. That is, it also is not necessary to know that name, but it is important, for example, how Prajnaparamita is shown. It is, a, everything is just a symbol. Prajnaparamita is shown with four arms. In one arm, she holds something in her hand that is called the Vajra. That is a, a symbol for that, what I called before, this tap, this method. In her other hand, he is holding, she's holding a book. That is a, more or less related to the aspect what I already explained, the shara, this wisdom. So she is holding in one hand the method, in the other one the wisdom. And the other two hands 
are being in the meditation posture. And that means she is uniting these two aspects of tap and chera or, uh, or method and, pra and wisdom in her state. That is a united state. And that itself is Tara. So she has the precise method, but uh, she in, me, in the same moment, she is a manifestation of wisdom. So then next, ta next step is our uh, Tara is very famous because she, uh, she is helping uh, every sentient being to overcome fears. So um, when, we, when we speak of fears, we um, have to understand where do fears arise? Or again, I tell you, observe yourself. Do the fears arise, out, arise outside of yourself? Like, for example, the fear of the COVID virus? Where is that fear? Are you sitting on that fear? Like you're sitting now on the chair? Is that outside of you? You can immediately observe it. Where is it? You have to discover that. Where is it? And then you understand it's in your mind. It's mind in general is called here, that era in Western world say always that is the brain. Mind is not always the brain. That is more or less our center here. That is more or less related to mind. So, then we have to understand what different, what uh, everything what appears outside is more or less a display of our mind. That is also symbolized by the moon. Genla was already explaining that, where Tara is sitting on. And uh, also that what manifests inside of us like our emotions, like our fears, that are all nothing else than a manifestation of our mind. So all the fears, the whatever kind of fear we have, uh, they are an aspect of dualism. Why that? Because it is saying, I am here and I am afraid of this, of that, or that. So there is always this aspect of me being afraid of something. This differentiation between me and the outside or the inside, that is called dualism. There is always a me, this called uh, the ego. And that me is scared by something. I am Oliver, I am scared by COVID virus. So my, what I call it, it's, uh, I call my name, but uh, actually to be Oliver is not me. That is just an aspect of the devil. When I identify myself with Oliver, that is called ego. It is just my manifestation in that moment. But there, there are money, it, it scares that uh, famous ego and that is, uh, that, uh, that is called uh, dualism. So the dualism, Fear exists only because there is the dualism of something outside and the ego. And uh, the fear is uh, the ego becomes, the fears can become so strong that they are trembling the ego. We do not know anymore what to do. And then uh, there are eight famous fears, and we can work with that in our everyday life. And we will do also then a little practice afterwards. There are eight fears, and when you hear the names of these eight fears, you may wonder, well, what is this guy talking about? That is strange. That is Indian ancient understanding, because the first fear is called the fear of the elephants. <laughs> you can say yourself, I am living in California. Where are the elephants besides the zoo? Nobody, nowhere. So we have other animals. Why do, why do we call it elephants? But you must understand that this is always a symbol and that is always related to our mind. So the story is, you know, elephants are very helpful for human beings. 
they are carrying trees, they, you can work, they, they are used for working. They are so fantastic and great animals, you can teach them, they are so helpful. But when they are coming in the moment that they want to make babies, then they get out of mind. They get completely blind and then they destroy the garden of the people uh, living there and just run after the female elephant trying to do that what they want to do. And uh, so you see, even if something is so useful, so helpful, it might become the, uh, all of the sudden, it might become so strong that it might kill you. So this is an example for being conditioned by inner and outer situations and our behavior can change very quickly. Something is so strong that we do not know anymore what to do. And you know, that is uh, many, many people uh, committing suicide. The, even young people, especially in Norway and in Austria, that is the highest rate in the world of suicide. Many young people, that is exactly that fear. There is whatever reason, and they become completely blind through that. There is no way out anymore. And the only reason what they think is to uh, stop this human condition. So that is called the elephant. It represents blindness and ignorance. The second one is the fear of lions. The lions uh, rep uh, represent pride. So you see, you are becoming like the director of something, like I am director of Ati Yoga Foundation or Shangjung Institute. So my ego, my pride becomes like a lion. I am now the king, the king of all animals. And when I roar, everybody is afraid of. My ego can become like that. And then I'm completely blind and, and cannot do anything anymore. That is, uh, Pride really that uh, doesn't help anything at all. It just uh, gives you a lot of problems if you do not observe yourself. Ah, now I'm very proud. Be careful. The second one is, uh, the third one is anger. No, it's fire and it represents the anger. So, fire, for example, we have in California, we have in Brasilia, we have in Argentina. Everywhere we have this fire. And you know what is the result of this fire. Everything is burned down. Then in California, you have all the smoke uh, um, making the, it's difficult time to breathe. It gives you hard time. You have to be careful. That is the same when inside yourself manifests anger and you know, Anger is like starting a small fire. And then you get more angry, more angry, more angry. And then suddenly that anger burns down everything. All that good things, what you have accumulated in your life, everything, it is burned down. So that is a uh, uh, fire burns down the forest of virtue, it is called. You try to have a virtuous life. But when you're angry, everything is destroyed. So this is the fear of, uh, of fire. The next one is the fear of poisonous snake. You see, when a snake bites you, then the, the veleno, the uh, poison, the poison goes into your, she bites and then the poison gets in your veins. And then through the circulation of your blood, it goes up to your heart and from there it is spread in your entire body. And that is jealousy. You get bitten by a small moment of being jealous. And in the, in the course of the time, you become more jealous, more jealous, more jealous. And then everything, everything, every moment, everything, becomes a manifestation or another reason for becoming more jealous. 
it is like that this poison spreads everywhere in your in your uh, in your body jealousy results in everything becomes a cause of agitation you cannot have any more a uh, calm mind you are so agitated if it's true or not that's another story but uh, anyway you need to observe yourself and that is oh i get jealous the next one is the fear of thieves thieves I mean, of everybody has the fear of thieves. If you have, therefore, you have, you know, these safes where you have put everything in the bank accounts, that, that the thieves do not come and, and steal everything. If you do not have anything and if you're poor, maybe you do not have so much fear of thieves, but the richer you are, the more you are afraid of thieves. But actually, what is the meaning? It is not the thieves stealing your material goods, even if that is uh, not good and uh, brings also suffering. But meaning is, you see, you try to understand something in your life. You try to understand to how can I be a good person? How can I help others? How can I be beneficial for my, my family? How can I be a good father? How can I good be, be a good mama? How can I be a good worker in the factory? How can I be a good director and, and work with my people in my factory? You always try to do something good, but also you think, how can I get rich? And then in order to benefit others, you always have that idea. And then somebody comes and tells you, hey man, listen, I have something for you. Don't always try to work for others. It's much better. We make a deal. You give me half of your income and I tell you how we could avoid paying taxes, how we can cheat people. You know, that is isn't it happening to us every day? Many, many political parties are using that system. I'm not a political person, but I know many institutions are thinking like that, like drugs and all these things. Huh? So that is the thieves. They're stealing your correct point of view, like helping others. They are stealing them. And you get, you do not have any more that idea of helping others. You just, just try to have this wrong views, this wrong uh, ideas, just working for the benefit of yourself and not taking care of others anymore. And what is the result? The result is what is called the spiritual desert. That is the result of that. There is no spirituality anymore. There's just greed. I want more money, more money, but when you, uh, I look many films, like American films, are these mafia bosses and so on with millions and millions and millions of dollars. I mean, in the films, I don't know anyone personally, but in the films, are they really happy with that money? According to the films, no. And that is called the spiritual desert. And that is called the spiritual poverty is more dangerous than the material poverty because uh, we do not get not do not get any happiness anymore and we will not have happiness in the future so that is the aspect of thieves the fear of thieves the next one is the chain the the, the fear of prisons prison and change uh, prisons prison and chain sorry prison and chain so this means you are put in chain in, in jail I mean, now you are not anymore in, 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 in chains in prison, but that was some years ago, some centuries ago, we, you were with iron chains. So what is this? That is representing greed. Our strong attachment to possessions and to material things become our jail because we can no longer live without them. You see, you do not have to go in prison. You already are in, in prison. 
you see, you go in the street, uh, you see a fancy dress. You need to have it. You need to buy it. Or these poor people who are drug addicted, you know, they do not want anymore to be addicted. But then they go in the street and they see their, what is called the pusher. So this is the person who gives them the, these materials, what they have to take because they're addicted. And then they are so afraid. I, I was together with one person being like that. We nearly had uh, uh, managed to get her out of all this prison of being addicted. But then we went in the street, she saw the pusher and then I could see she was like being really in jail. I have to do that. I have to do that. I have to do that. I cannot do anything else. Then I just took that person away and said, no, 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 come on, let's go and do a retreat. It was very, very painful, a lot of suffering, but that person managed it. So this is not only drug addiction, this is the addiction, like, you know, so many people are, are addicted to playing games, poker, uh, drugs, alcohol, uh, material goods, sex, you know, there are all these problems we have with uh, sexual problems, uh, mainly men are doing. This is being in prison. So that is, uh, uh, the, it is saying the iron chains, because here we are talking about chains, they symbolize the habituation to lust and desire that bind together the senses and their objects. So that is one example of one book. And then uh, the next one is the, uh, the fear of water. You know, we have some year, you know, uh, the United Nation has proclaimed this century now, uh, the century of the water, shortage of water. There are many places already now in 2020, there have hardly, in any moments of the, of the year, they have good water to drink. Like many places in Africa, but also in India, not everybody has access to pure water. Here in Austria, we are very, we are so blessed. We have the mountains, we have the clearest and purest water you can imagine, similar like in the Himalayan era. That is pure water. That is such a beneficial situation. So that is good. We need water to drink, to wash. But, you know, some years ago, the tsunami in, in, in India or in, in Japan, I mean, what happened? The tsunami, the water, which is so good and so helpful, and we really need it to live. But if this water gets out of control, it can destroy hundreds and thousands of people. And every year we have floods, like very often in America also, the floods with the hurricane is coming and they destroy all the, these errors. So that is more or less the symbol for our attachment, the attachment that gets out of control. Even if uh, it is very good to have some things, when our attachment gets too strong and gets out of control, then it is said, then there is no space of anything else anymore. We are obsessed with the object of our attachment. We worry about not getting it and fear of losing it once, uh, of losing it. So it is similar to one fear we already described, but here that is specified with the water. Really, that is, uh, uh, in another, it said the rivers or the floor, the floods are a symbol of desire, of our desires. And uh, they can get so strong. And then the, the last one is the, the fear of demons. I mean, you can say in the Western world, well, we do not have demons. We have our internet. We can just check everything, what, what there is. And we immediately, Google gives us immediately an answer. 
what is right and wrong. So what about the talk, talk about demons? But actually demons symbolize something completely else. And that is one of the main problems in our society, especially for young people. And that is having no self-confidence anymore. Having no faith in oneself. We are always doubting about ourselves. Is this correct what I do? Is this right or wrong? What shall I do? This a famous, you know, maybe many of you are already too old, but it was this famous new future generation. You know, some years uh, ago where there was a uh, lot of talk uh, talks about this new future generation. Now we have gener uh, generation X or y or generation Y and so on, many different words. But one of them was this new future generation. Completing, having no faith. Who am I? I am, you know, in the television, you always have these shows. You do dancing, you do some singing or whatever, and there is always then a kind of team judging you. You did it well, you did it not well. You go to the next round. So you have no any trust in yourself. You depend totally on that what others tell you. These are the demons because so many people, I know that some people went to some of these casting shows. They were not taken there. They did not go to the next round. They had, they, end, they ended up in such a big this depression. It's unbelievable. That means the demons. The demons possess slowly yourself. But where are all that what we were talking? Only in your mind. Everything is in your mind. And so now, then, when we understood, well, that everything is in my, in my mind, and how can I discover it? By observing myself. Yes, today I am afraid of starving. I did not eat the whole day. If I don't eat, I will die immediately. Or I have $10,000 at home, I'm afraid the thieves will come. It's all fine, these thoughts. Nothing is wrong with them. The only thing is you need to observe that. You must be honest to yourself. You can also say to yourself, I don't know who I am. I'm such a stupid, ignorant person, whatever. Yes, fine. Welcome even that. That is symbolized what Genla already said with this lotus coming out from the mud and manifesting in the greatest purity. That is observing oneself, being honest to oneself, and then recognizing that everybody else is being in the same state, in the same dimension. Everybody has these thoughts. You're not this only special one. Everybody has fears, has worries, has suffering, has enjoyment, has un moments of unhappiness. We are not something extraordinary. We are very special because we are. But we are only in that moment when we recognize ourselves. And based on that, what I just said, then we can also do some, some wish that, uh, that we could do, to, which is helpful for others. And that then is that called the, the, the very simple way of doing the practice of Tara in a very simple way, without any initiation, without knowing anything about, about all the different uh, aspects that we, we will do afterwards also. That is, uh, that is fine. But the mother, everything is based on that, what I said. Understanding the situation of oneself, you have a body, in your body you're breathing and you have your mind who is thinking, judging, having fears, having emotions and so on. And then you understand that also others have a body and energy and, uh, and they're thinking. And you are very well off because you already have that understanding. And then you try to do something for the benefit of others. That is the base 
of uh, that is the wisdom, the aspect of shera, of green tara, and the top, the method we can do. Okay. Thank you so much, Oliver. Excellent. That's wonderful. I really enjoy listening to you explain all of these things. So, all righty. Okay. So we have a few minutes, and then I just want to um, go back to Menpa Punsa Guangmola. Genla, do you have any uh, closing uh, things to add? Anything else to say before we finish for today? Um, thank you, Oliver. Really, it's uh, such a great to hear. Uh, no, I don't have a lot of things to add in because uh, we had a sort of like full teaching. So more than that, I think we do not need it. But I just want to say, since we learned this, the green data is like the mother. Mother means is a kind. Mother means is a loving. Mother does not mean it's just give something, produce, but it is that the mother is like seed of the kind of compassions. So today's, I mean, always we need a loving kind, but at the moment in our society, it looks like we need really more these kind of things. We have a lot of technologies. We are very advanced, well knowledge. And also in the world, more or less everybody got very well educations. Not only in the human got education, but also animals getting educations. But the bottom line is still somehow we are lacking the kindness and then sort of like it like the understanding of the what is the value of the human life. So I really hope each of us somehow through this green data practice or this webinar get a sort of like, we already have the seed of the loving kind in our body. If we don't have that sense of beginning, nothing to do. But the old teachers explained we do have the seed of the loving kind in our body. I totally feel that. I really hope we can develop that and then grow that. We can polish that, able to see more sort of like our inner loving kind come outside that carry into the practicums and to share with the, the families, neighbors, societies, communities, and we able to share more this kind of to the beyond than our, you know, like territories more in the worldwide. So that's really, I'm looking forward. And then I want to say thank you for everything. Um, so more or less that then if you have any questions about the Tibetan medicine, please go back to check with our website as Adam La mentioned. So I want to say thank you, Oliver. Thank you. And thank you all the team. So that's all I want to say. And then I want to say really special thanks to the, all the, our listeners, participants, and the, who's sharing our webinars to other people's friends. So I really want to say thank you for all of the people who are listening our webinars. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Menpa Punsa Guangmola. Thank you very much for sharing with us. And thank you so much, Oliver, for joining us today and giving us that uh, excellent uh, explanation of the fears and the nature of Tara and the uh, nature of a method and wisdom. Um, thank you so much for being with us. And uh, everybody, thank you again. I'll echo uh, Menpa Guangmola's uh, uh, thanks to all of our listeners. We really do appreciate your support. Thank you for tuning in and joining us. It's wonderful to spend time with you. And of course, if you are interested in any of our programs, especially um, Menpa Punta Guangmo's upcoming course on making garlic ghee chudlen, then uh, please check our website and, and check our links there. And also don't forget for that particular workshop, you can use the 10% uh, off promo code webinar10. 
uh, will be our special offer for you. And we look forward to seeing you there. Uh, again, thank you so very much to everybody. We wish you many blessings and very well. My name is Adam Okerblom here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, this has been the Shangsheng Institute School of Tibetan Medicine ongoing webinar series. Uh, and we will see you next time very soon. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, the whole team. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Genla. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to all the listeners.